Oh, so hi everyone, my name is Vinci and I'm currently a data analyst at Canva. So today I'm going to be talking about a fairly big modeling project that I worked on back in June or July to build a combined mobile and web sessionization model. Roughly the agenda for today is first I'm going to talk a little bit about Canva and the business context behind it. Secondly, I'm going to talk, go into a bit of detail about the modeling process. We'll be talking about the business impact and then finally talking about some of the lessons learned and how I'll be doing things differently next time. But to start off with a little bit about Canva, I haven't, if you haven't heard of it before, we're a design software and our mission is to empower the world to design. So that includes things you can print like business cards and posters, but also includes digital designs like building Facebook ads and also presentations like this one. We're a software as a service company. so. Uh, and we operate on a freemium model. So what that means is that we have a free product, but we also have paid subscription products as well as separate enterprise and education products. We also operate on many platforms. So it exists as a web application within the browser, as you can see on the screen, a desktop app, as well as Android and iOS mobile apps. A bit of the history of data at Canva. So I started at Canva at the beginning of last year, back in January 2019, and I was about the fifth or sixth analyst to join Canva. We're now at almost 30 analysts and we handle about 30 billion events per month. So you can kind of imagine the kind of hyper growth that Canva is seeing, especially with data. In terms of our tooling, we migrated to the modern data stack at the end of last year. So Fivechan, Snowflake, DBT, and Looker. And in terms of event tracking, we have an in-house solution that's roughly similar to Segment. So we fire page view events when we load web pages and we fire screen view events when we load screens on mobile apps. Which brings me back to June or July when I was sitting in the marketing analytics team. and. These are a small sample of some of the questions I was regularly asked. So what are our top landing pages? Where do our users come from? How many signups did paid advertising contribute to? And if you're familiar with any kind of marketing analytics, you'll know that the core model behind all of this is sessionization. For those of you who don't know what sessionization is, it's basically a grouping of web pages. So in industry, we generally restart a session if it's been more than 30 minutes since a visitor's last page route or if there are new UTM parameters. And here's an example of what a fact session table would look like. So each row in this table represents a visitor's session. It'll have a start and an end timestamp, a user ID, the visitor ID, or some people call it the anonymous ID. In this case, we also, in this case, we can see that the visitor Googled something clicked on a search result and then landed on Canva. Uh, and this kind of information tells you how long they stayed on your website for as well. And this is really helpful for any questions related to our web product. But Canva is a global product and we operate in pretty much all markets, including Latin America and Southeast Asia that are very mobile heavy, which means that most of their population uses mobile apps over a desktop computer. And so really the kinds of questions I was getting asked were things like this, like where do mobile signups come from? Does this include people who sign up on app? How many users visited Canva on mobile apps? And this led to, I want to say a month long project on implementing a combined web and mobile sessionization model. So I'll be going through the steps that I took that was surprisingly difficult or finicky. So for the audience, I have two main objectives today. First, I hope some or all of you will be able to walk away with being able to roughly understand how to model a combined sessionization model. Second, I hope you understand the overarching process in being working with complex models and scale, and you can take this back, some of this knowledge back to your own organizations. So with sessionization, one thing that was really, really important to us was being able to stitch together impressions that started on a Canva landing page and ended up inside the app. So to begin with our work, we had to union together our page views and screen views. And in my head, this was very, very easy, but it turned out to be a little tricky because the tables look different and there were different columns named different things. Thanks, Daniel. So as an example, 
Uh, on the left here, we have our page view event, which comes with a user agent string. And this can be broken down to things like category, browser, version, operating system, operating system version. And if you actually understand what these column names means, congratulations. I extremely did not when I first looked at it. On the other hand, screen views did not come in with a user agent string, but it did come with some values in a context blob that looked that included things like device category, browser name, browser version, operating system name, and operating system version. And so after understanding the data that came through in each event a bit more, I realized that the values in these columns were comparable. So having mismatched columns was really annoying, but technically wise, this was reasonably easy to fix with some renames. So step one in the data modeling process, it seems a little obvious, but it's really to understand your source data. And this takes a lot of time. You're going to dig into event properties that no one has touched for months or years. You're going to ask a bunch of people, they will redirect these all over the place and you just have to figure out exactly where it comes from and what it means. So looking back to earlier, where I mentioned it was really important for us to stitch together page views from a Canva landing page on mobile and then ending up inside an app. So a sessionization model relies, it knows how to group pages together based on an anonymous ID, which is a unique identifier for a visitor. And this is usually generated by the browser very independently from an app which meant that somehow we needed to be able to pass on this anonymous ID being fired from the app after a user visits the browser. So we want to be able to have the same anonymous ID regardless of whether we're on the browser or on the app. And so in this situation, we worked with a bunch of engineers to be able to generate the anonymous ID on a browser and then figure out how to pass it on to the app. Thanks engineers. Some of you who are paying close attention might be thinking, but wait, what about the case when a user starts on the mobile app and then ends up on the browser? Would you still be passing an anonymous ID from here? The answer to that for us was, do we really care about this? It really represents a tiny set of sessions because intuitively you would imagine your users end up on the, or finish up on the app. But the kind of engineering work that it takes to pass something from the app to the browser is huge. And so step two of the modeling process is to think about your edge cases. And then after that, try to understand your organization's tolerance for correctness. Like how important is it to be super correct if it's really, really hard? So make the trade-off between correctness and complexity. And so at this point, the logic for our sessionization model was done and it was theoretically perfect, theoretically. So <laughs> there was just the one problem, which was we had a lot of data that it kept timing out during testing. Uh, that made me really sad. What I haven't mentioned yet is we tried to sneak in a small additional change to our table. So we needed to add in city level data. And it turned out that trying to run IP address geocoding was extremely inefficient. So we would run this model overnight and I can't tell you how long it would have taken to actually finish running. We don't know if it would have taken 12, 18, 24 hours. It just kept timing out. And so I decided to rope in some of my favorite people, the data engineers, uh, to help me tackle this problem. Specifically, I worked really, really closely with Krishna, who also spoke earlier today. Uh, and to give a bit more on the detail of the problem, this is what this is a small sample of what our page view event looked like. So we have event ID, a user ID, anonymous ID, the page URL, the URL before that, what platform the user was on, and also an IP address. And what we were trying to do is we wanted to introduce some geolocation fields like country code and city. We'd actually had country code before this, and so we wanted to add in city. Um, if you've never tried to map IP addresses to country code or cities before in SQL, how it usually works is you have some sort of mapping table that has IP networks. So that's a range of IPs, which is mapped to some geo attributes. So the country, the city, the state, 
And we were doing this within our page view model. And this is like the, the small part of SQL that does it. So essentially here, we're joining to an IP lookup table. It's an integer range join. So it's quite slow. And this was easy to implement when we first did it in January. And our models totally ran fine back then. But for some reason, when we tried to do a full refresh back in July, it didn't work. It, probably because we had just added in so much data at that point, had grown so much already. Um, so we started working on designing for performance and Krishna brought up this modeling technique called Data Vault. I don't think it's too important to get into the nitty gritty, but the goal of this slide is to understand the core concepts on why this type of modeling might be more performant. So in this example, we're looking into IP geocoding, but we've also used a similar technique in other parts of our sessionization model. The two core concepts we're using here, one is equality joins on integers that are really, really fast in Snowflake. So in this case, for every IP address that comes into our data, what we want to do is we want to map it to an integer surrogate key. So in our case, we simply use an incremental number. So the first IP address we ever saw, we gave the surrogate key number one, the next one we gave number two. So it's very much like a database. The second kind of concept that we're using here is we wanted to abstract out the heavy logic of IP geocoding into a separate table. This is good for several reasons. So one is the table is slimmer, which means the logic can run over less data. So we're definitely only running, converting the IP address to geocoding. So on like a unique IP addresses. And it's also nicer for our brain because it's like quite complex logic and having that all in one model is really hard to understand. So in this case, we created a separate table. So we've called it context IP network geography. And then for each IP address, we pulled out the country and city using our IP address mapping table. The goal that we have at the end is to be able to join the top page view table with their geo attributes together again. From here, the modeling process is a little bit more straightforward. So we want to load page views into our warehouse with the surrogate key. So what we do is we take the original event that comes in and then we join it to this mapping table to end up with something like this. So we end up having a materialized table which has page view information in it, including the IP address surrogate key as a column on the end. And then finally, as the last step, kind of in the last layer of the warehouse, we join based on the IP address surrogate keys to get the IP geo attributes. Now there's a few benefits here. So one is because joining integers is really fast. We can join it in views towards the end of the warehouse build or towards the end of the DAG. And the key benefit here is really the flexibility we needed. So if we wanted to add in additional information like state level data or update the IP address mapping tables over time, then we can just rebuild this context table without rebuilding the entire chain of sessionization tables, which includes page views. So that makes it really nice and easy to update just part of the model, but it saves us a huge amount of computational costs, both data engineering and analytics time and also brain power. So after a couple of weeks of extremely hard work, the tables finally ran and it was glorious. So step three in the data modeling process is really work with your stakeholders, especially with your talented data engineers, because you both know things that the other doesn't. Then after that is when you solve for performance issues. Now, performance issues are a thing at Canva because we are growing so fast and we have so much data, but if you're a small organization and your build runs in like an hour or two, it's probably not even worth solving. 
And of course, like this whole process is very, very iterative. Like you want to check. I mean, when I was working with Krishna, we were working uh, together, but then we were also iteratively solving these performance issues one at a time. In terms of business impact, to be honest, up until this point in time, we made some fundamentally incorrect assumptions around our users. We had a bunch of dashboards, we'd done analysis, we'd been looking at this kind of data, but there was a catch and it was that it was all based on our web user behavior. And we basically totally ignored at least a huge portion of our user base. After we finished building this model, we actually found out that mobile organic users, so users who come in organically through the mobile app store was actually one of our biggest channels. And being able to compare this directly with web organic traffic meant that we were able to drive a completely different strategy for mobile. So some of these sounds really simple, but for us and our stakeholders, it was utterly amazing to have a source of truth for exactly how many visitors and how many sessions we had in Canva, both on mobile apps and web. We were suddenly able to attribute web and mobile conversions like signups, trials, and activated users and in a way that wasn't based on only a subset of our users. We were able to build some performance dashboards during our look and migration, which meant that our stakeholders were able to self-serve themselves questions and ask us less simple questions. And as a result of that, we could also pinpoint weak points in our acquisition funnel and were able to devise some valid driven strategies. Some of the lessons learned, one is to really reach out to data communities like the DVC Slack to solve really hard problems because about a week later after the IP address fiasco, someone posted a better way of handling geocoding and it really would have saved us like two weeks of time. So one week later, good DVT information. <laughs> the second thing is to really lean on data engineering. So I worked really closely with Krishna and it was just one of the situations where you have to collaborate because as an analyst, I knew exactly what my stakeholders wanted. I knew how I wanted to count sessions and really understood the edge cases of the sessionization model. As a data engineer, Krishna was able to suggest new data modeling techniques and together we were able to discuss all the traders and settle on a like good solution that was great for both of us. And the third learning is to not try to solve all the problems at once. So there are a lot of problems with the sessionization model for us. So one computationally, it took a really, really long time to refresh. And this was caused by several things, including like an extremely wide table, the IP address geocoding, sessionization has like five steps in it. We had a lot of downstream tables like attribution that would be impacted and they would also need to be refreshed. We kept changing things and that meant we wanted to fully refresh the sessionization models fairly often, which was really expensive. And so we tried to solve like two or three of these problems at a time, but that turned out to be a little bit of a disaster because it was hard to know exactly where the problem was. So my learning here is that it's here to change it small so it's easy to debug. The fourth and maybe like the most important learning is to know when to stop optimizing. So the sessionization model, running it was very expensive. At one point we would just leave it on a two or four Excel on Snowflake, leave it overnight and it just burned so much money. So we'd started optimizing it and we made some changes and eventually we realized even though we had more ideas on how to improve the model, a full refresh of these models ended up only costing us a couple hundred dollars. And so at that point, it was really no longer worth our time to improve the model and to save like a measly, I don't know, 50, hundred bucks on top of that. So learning number four, no one to quit optimizing. And that brings me to the end of my session. <laughs>